Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Bob Woods, who has been doing some wonderful work in getting information out about the extraterrestrial presence, and he's been looking at it from a particular angle that uh, does bring to, these, to the public's attention the importance of these issues, and, and that is the retrieval of crashed uh, UFOs, extraterrestrial vehicles. Uh, what gives him expertise in this area? Well, he's, he's got a PhD in physics, in aero engineering from Cornell University. He spent 43 years working for McDonnell Douglas. Uh, he's been active in Rotary International, uh, Mutual UFO Network, Methodist Church, and it's really uh, the work he's done in bringing to the general public the documentation that has been existing concerning the uh, extraterrestrial presence, crashed UFOs, that he's been bringing this out. And it's this, this work really has inspired many people to take this phenomenon serious. And because of his background in uh, McDonnell Douglas and uh, his de de advanced degrees, he really does have a lot of credibility. And we're very fortunate to have him address the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Michael. I really do want to make the world a better place to transform it the way we're talking about today. And I want to eliminate hunger and death and everything you heard, everything you, oh, okay. And everything you heard this morning with Hector. But my story is pretty straightforward. It doesn't have a lot of emotional content in it. So uh, you're going to have to um, keep your mind on the left brain. <laughs> I'll be talking about three things, basically uh, leaked documents, the crash retrievals, <coughs> and how the public has been kept in the dark by the powers that be for so long, which has been a theme that we just heard about from Steve. But before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about my background, because one of the questions I always get at the end of a talk is, how did you get started in this business anyway? And so I'll tell you that right now. Basically. It was about 1967, maybe 66, and my boss had to give a presentation to the Air Force on the occasion of the retirement of General Schriever. The Air Force had asked us at McDonnell Douglas to predict what would be the technology we'd use to get orbit and back in 10 years hence. And so just for a joke, I said, well, Ray, why don't you tell them about how the alleged UFOs do it? He said, hey, that's a great idea. Why don't you work on that? So I read my first UFO book on company time. <laughs> <laughs> and pretty soon I'd read about 50 books and had concluded that there was just no doubt that they were craft and that there were people inside of them and they were intelligent beings. And so I went to my management. At that time, I was a young executive, and so my management had a lot of confidence in me, and I t said, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you, but the fact of the matter is that UFOs are actually manned by ETs, and the only question is whether we discover how gravity control works before or after Lockheed. Lockheed, of course, was our competitor. <laughs> so actually, what happened was they gave, uh, gave me a time to have a couple guys work on this project, and in three years we spent $500, which was the same amount of money that was spent in, by the Condon Committee. We didn't find the answer, we canceled the project, project, but in the meantime, I wound up hiring the best guy that I could find around who was willing to look at the literature and try to find out the clues for how the USFOs might work, and, and his name was Stan Friedman. So Stan worked for me for a while, and, uh, and when I retired, uh, 25 years later, I retired in 1993, in the meantime, the ordinary thing like work on defensive missiles for the Cold War and all that was fun but uh, nevertheless when I retired I was poised and eager to do the thing I'd wanted to do ever since 1970 when we stopped this project and that is figure out how we get to the stars. How do we find the sources of energy that would give us free energy? And so my son and I kind of teamed together and we gave a presentation to what is now the Laughlin Conference and uh, Rich was impressed with the work that we'd done on uh, authenticating some documents that I'll talk about. And so he asked us if we'd make a television documentary on this subject. So we did. It was called The Secret. The guy's name was Joe Firmage. And so he paid for this documentary, which aired on Sci-Fi Channel. Uh, not as many times as Steve just said, the, the 
taken yeah. aired, but it did air for six times in three years. And so it's, it's a pretty good thing. And actually, uh, we sell them too out on the, on the uh, bench. So that's the background. Now we're going to talk about these three subjects, the leaked documents, the crash retrievals, and the psychological operations. The leaked documents are shown here. The left-hand column is the source. There are 13 different sources beginning in 1984 uh, when uh, Jamie Chandra received this uh, package of the Eisenhower briefing document and ending up in 2001 when I got my last uh, set from uh, Timothy, uh, Timothy Cooper. And I'll tell you a little bit more about him later. The second column is when the documents arrived. The third column is the number of documents from each person. The fourth column is the number of pages. And you can see I have nearly 4,000 pages of classified documents. Well, not all classified, but I'd say at least 1,000 of them are classified top secret or more. And the classifications are on the right. TS stands for top secret, M for magic, EO for eyes only. OK, so this is the same list of 13 sources. And this is the list of the documents that were involved. And because there is limited time, as Steve has just finished mentioning, we'll not cover them all. We'll just cover a few to give you the feeling of what has been involved in this authentication process. And the few that we're going to cover begin with the pre-1947 crashes. Now, most of you probably assume that, except for those that have been with us for millennia, the first reports in modern era began with Roswell. And in fact, that's not true. Uh, they began earlier than that. They began not including the ones that I believe that uh, uh, Michael feels might have occurred in Germany in the, in the late 30s, and not including that occurred in Cape Girardeau, Missouri in 1941. But the ones that occurred pre-1947 have to do primarily with the Battle of Los Angeles. But before we get there, let me give you the background. For the War of the Worlds in 1938, just around Halloween, you know, the, uh, the Orson Welles program, having the aliens land from Mars, caused some degree of panic. And I, I really believe that the governments were pretty well convinced aliens were here, that the public would really be upset and, and maybe panicky. So this background was, was really relevant for, for, for later when they made decisions about keeping it secret. But there was a crash in 41 I just talked about, then the Los Angeles air raid, one in May 47, two in Roswell, and many more recoveries since then. And we'll talk about those recoveries in the next second part of my talk. But let's focus in on the Los Angeles Air Raid. It was February 25th, 1942, just really a little bit after Pearl Harbor. And 1,430 rounds of ammunition were expended. And according to George Marshall, who wrote it in a, a secret telegram to FDR, one craft was captured in San Bernardino and one was salvaged by the Navy at sea. Now, the, as a result of this, FDR wrote immediately uh, the next day to Marshall and uh, said he disagreed with the idea that the technology should be shared with the Soviet Union. And that he was initiating some consultation with Dr. Bush. Vannevar Bush was at that time our premier senior scientist from MIT. And that, that the recovery of these craft was vital to the nation's superiority. The Army would have the fruits of research and exploring further applications wonder. So uh, that was his uh, contribution and direction to uh, Marsh, George Marshall. Then a, a week later, Marshall wrote back in response to the direction that he received in that letter, establishing the Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit. And actually, can top there, you can, if you can see it in the front row, you can see this says Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit, which is a stamp that's added to this. He uh, established that. and in effect says that secret sources of intelligence confirmed that this is of interplanetary origin. And he also noted that it had been an aerial phenomenon since 1897. And these words, if you really look in the middle of it, it says that uh, the Army Air Corps has recovered uh, 
craft of the San Bernardino Mountains east of Los Angeles, which can, cannot be identified as conventional aircraft. This headquarters has come to a determination that the mystery airplanes are in fact earthly, and according to secret intelligence sources, they are in all probability of interplanetary origin. So that's the chief of, chief of staff of the United States Army writing to the President of the United States in 1942 in a case where we don't have an original letter, but we have uh, uh, an outstanding copy and it's all consistent with authenticity. Here's an example of why it's so consistent, because it has the right kind of markings uh, representing the Office of the Chief of Staff at that time. Now, so it, it, it goes on for a couple more years and it turns out that the president, FDR, set up something called the Non-Terrestrial Science and Technology Committee. And it's clear that this committee, you know, like all committees, they met, they thought, they talked, and then they asked for more money. <laughs> so, so he had received this request for more money from them, and this is the letter that, that does that. But he responds to them by saying, the, uh, the, the, there's a problem. We've got to win the war first, we've got to beat the Nazis. There'll be a time when the surplus funds will be available, and then the United States will assume its destiny, and he went on to command the committee. So uh, basically, he didn't give them the money to do the reverse engineering for the craft that we had already recovered, which at that, at that point would have been at least three. It had a rare double secret top stamp, top secret stamp, and uh, he used the language that was consistent with his selection of words. Don't have original paper, but nevertheless, it's, it's uh, very likely authentic. Now, then go on, and we find that FDR died, of course, and then you saw the picture of Harry Truman. Now, you didn't see the picture of Vannevar Bush, but Vannevar Bush was still the key technology guy, and he went to Harry and said, Harry, you know, something you don't know about, that during the war we got some UFOs. And here's the background on it, and now maybe is the time, and this was July 4th, 1947, now maybe is the time to initiate a program to find out the technology behind these crafts. And he went on to conclude in his letter that this would be the key to our security as a nation, to our better health, to more jobs, to a higher standard of living, and to our cultural progress. Now those are all the things that Earth transformation, I think, is, is in favor of, except maybe the security as a nation. Anyway, uh, Vannevar Bush said, let's start here in the United States and try to get these things to make the world a better place. And so, uh, he had the right opinion. The question of whether or not it should have been a secret program or, or not is, is open, but at that time we were just beginning our problems with the Cold War. So in summary then, the leaked documents that we have is uh, 27th Feb February 1 from uh, FDR to uh, telling Marshall that Dr. Bush is proceeding and then Marshall setting up the Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit and the Non-Terrestrial Science and Technology Committee. Now the, then there's one that you haven't uh, talked about, probably the first exopolitics letter that exists. In fact, I don't know that Steve has ever thought of this particular document as exopolitical letter, but they asked Einstein, what would be your opinion of the impact of uh, inhabitants from celestial bodies on, on the United States? And so he has a five-page letter dealing with that subject, and it's pretty good reading. It's found in a, in a book that uh, my son Ryan and I, and uh, was found, funded by Joe Firmage, published called The Majestic Documents, which is a, a summary of all these question documents that we have. It's not only a summary, it's the details of them. Okay, so now there's another perspective that emerges from this. I mentioned there was a 1941 crash. I didn't tell you that it was the Army and the FBI that recovered that in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. In 1942, we had the Army and the Navy involved in the Battle of LA recoveries, and then we had the 47 recoveries that included the Atomic Energy Committee. Then the CIA, of course, was formed in 1947, and they wanted to get their, their act in, and then the Air Force became, uh, from the Air, Army Air Force, we had the Air Force. So, but all these different agencies, and each one of them had their own security program for monitoring this problem of the crash flying saucers and what to do with them. Little sidebar here, how do you authenticate these documents? Well, you establish the provenance if you can, in other words, a record of who has been the owner. 
And then you look at the physical aspects, you try to date the ink or the watermark or the paper or the typewriter font or you, you maybe can match the printing press font. Compare the signatures and intellectually you can do some things too. You can hunt for anachronisms, things that are out of place or consistency for things that are in place. Compare the language use and, and look at known authentic documents in comparison. And we have some examples of those coming up. All right, so that takes care of the exposure to pre-1947 crashes. And now each of you knew something, I hope, that you didn't know before. And that is before Roswell, there were, lots, there were other crashes. The, the second document I'm going to talk about is the first annual report. And this is actually found in this document in detail, 16 pages long. It was leaked to Timothy Cooper. And it gives the status of a dozen technologies. Clearly what had happened was that uh, the government had done their thing and up till 1951, they had been reverse engineering the craft and they had learned something. And this is a summary of what we'd learned to that point. It had identified some individual crashes and talked about incidents had occurred that were also known and confirmed in the open literature. And basically had the theme of the, the fact that it was so important to reconstruct the technology and that the boost to our current efforts would be incalculable if we kept going to continue to reverse engineer and understand the, the science behind the crash flying saucers. And specifically, they talked about microcircuitry being so miniaturized. They talked about new viruses and bacterial agents so lethal that serums derived by genetic research could revolutionize pharmaceuticals. How cells replica replicate themselves. They talked about their ability to jam radio, telephone, and power grids, clearly that that had happened. They said the security exceeds that of the H-bomb. The protection of rights was outweighed by the nature of the threat. Now this is very important because this is the first time in a document you see in writing that they concluded that the problem of interacting with ETs means they didn't have to follow the constitutional rights that we've been all protected uh, with. So uh, very important and that's basically where the thrust of exopolitics I think should be. You start right at the constitution. The most difficult thing is the actual control of the press. This particularly is relevant to the things that I'll say at the end of this talk on the psychological operations and technology for use in controlling the media and perception of the public. Now the document say I received, many of them came from Tim Cooper and Tim Cooper was a, uh, he, he was a, involved in uh, law enforcement to some extent, but his father was in the military and he had a remarkable career. Apparently he was at Alamogordo during one of these crashes and was a printer, so he became quite expert in printing. Uh, Timothy Cooper made relevant requests for FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, re with respect to who killed JFK in late 1988, but he was so persistent and he also started to ask about UFOs. So we think that disgruntled or disillusioned document declassifiers chose to leak the documents to him. And his father actually was one of the leakers to Len Stringfield. He was written up in Len Stringfield uh, documents as one of the sources. But his name was Harry Bob Cooper and he received a special citation from Curtis LeMay for his work for the Air Force and, and amazingly enough, you know, I don't know whether you can read that, but I'll read it. It says, it says, his exemplary knowledge of film processing and printing techniques provided necessary aids in photographic production for intelligence evaluation of gun camera film and still photographs requested on call by the Foreign Technology Division in the National Photographic Interpretation Center in their contributions to the USAF UFO program. Now, I've never seen anywhere else that the Air Force has a UFO program, but, <laughs> but here we have a commendation from the general that's a legitimate document uh, thanking Harry Bob Cooper for his work on gun cameras. So th that I think is a very significant point. All right, we'll go to the third document now, which is the Special Operations Manual. Actually, Michael mentioned this uh, yesterday, Extraterrestrial Entities and Technology Recovery and Disposal. What has happened was that I created a replica. Ooh, it didn't bring in a replica. 
Let's see. Nope, I guess it didn't bring in a replica. But anyway, the replica is about this big. It's, it's on a table out there. And it was created from a roll of undeveloped film that had been mailed to Don Berliner. Unquestionably, this document was printed in the 50s, and I'll tell you why in a moment. This is what the original box looked like to Don Berliner. We found out where it came from, which drugstore, and uh, there was some research on who mailed it, but that's not the story. The story is that this is the photograph of the document. And what it's basically, uh, there were issues that related with authenticity here. Some people argued, well, this is restricted with top secret. You can't have both at the same document. But there are examples. It has War Office logo. And this was 1954 document. And uh, the War Office was eliminated in 1946 or 7. A footnote imprint identifies MJ12 as a customer. This is the Majestic 12 group that was doing all of the research on uh, reverse engineering set up by Harry Truman. And the TO, or technical order numbers, are consistent with the policy at the time. So anyway, these things are, are, all, uh, are all relevant, but it turns out that each one of them is a, is a false uh, concern because this is an official document. Here's an example that destroys the argument for top secret restricted. And let me tell you what it says, though. Basically, it says the purpose of the manual is to recover the ET remains and keep it secret. In general, it says the craft are two or discs, cigars, triangles, entities are one of two types, and uh, the materials are not known to terrestrial science. Security is of massive importance, and it's important to keep the public in the dark. It gives creating and uncreating instructions, but different ones depending on whether you're in a foreign country. So clearly, this was a program that was designed to recover UFOs that crashed in foreign lands as well. Previous slide, okay. Yes, this this is a this is a copy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is a copy that shows the use of top secret and restricted together. That's the point. It's the uh, yeah. Ammonia, ammonia. Well, you're asked why do I show this, Be and that's because everybody wants to know what they look like. And this manual has a description of what they look like as in 1954, EBE-1 and EBE-2, extraterrestrial biological entity. And there's a half a page description for each one of these creatures. And I gave this to my forensic artist friend, Bill McDonald. And he, without adding anything, described what the words said in terms of the description. And this was EBE-1, EBE-2 is shown here. This is small gray with the wraparound eyes. Uh, that you're so familiar uh, with hearing about. And then both of them in some sort of uniform. These are the shapes that were in this manual in 1954, based on 1953 intelligence, central intelligence. And the four shapes are, are shown, the, the usual saucer, then the, uh, the thousand foot long cigar, the 300 foot triangle, and then it's upside down ice cream cone. So, or ice, not upside down, it's ice cream cone. <laughs> so, and then those are the same shapes that we see today. Now, the deception policy was very clear. It uh, says that it may become necessary to issue false statements to preserve the security of the site. Meteors, down satellites, weather balloons, military aircraft, all acceptable alternatives. And this was leaped on immediately by the skeptics saying, well, how could you have an argument for down satellites when the first satellite didn't go up until 1957? It's a 1954 document. And the answer is, I got a long list of, of clearly well-read, well-publicized articles all dealing with the concern about crashing satellite parts in 1954. And the other argument here is the raised Z. I took this to the United States government printing office, walked in with this top secret document in my possession. Uh, the guards didn't get it. <laughs> and I remember my appointment with the guy who's supposed to deal with the public, and I said, I've got a specialized question. So, and of course the question was, is there some basis for this being authentic? And after he studied it for a while, he said, well, you know, he said, based on the content, he said, my initial reaction would be clearly it's a hoax. 
But he says, you know, there's something about it that makes me think twice, and that is the, the fact that there's a raised z. And see right here, there's a little z that's raised. raised and, uh, and this is a, a blow up of that same raised z. But he, what he said is what, what happened was on a hot lead printing press like this, where this slug comes down, if there's an unused letter, there's a little bit of crud that gets on that, and sometimes that letter is raised two times out of three above the rest of the type, type font. They got rid of that problem after a while. But he said, this raised Z is to me uh, uh, an earmark, is a zinger of the fact that it is an absolutely authentic document in terms of the fact it was printed in 1954. And for comparison, my son Ryan found a 1954 November camera guide, uh, which is shown here on the right, that had the same raised Z. There were also some etymological reasons, in other words, language reasons, as to why it's authentic, uh, that speak for themselves. Uh, first aid in this document is initial caps. Now it's first aid, lowercase. Screwdriver was two words. They were using a screwdriver to uh, fasten some of the packages as they sip the parts. Now screwdriver is one word, and I guess that occurred about the same time we started using it to describe vodka and orange juice. Craft uh, tape. Is, was initial caps then with a the craft, and that's not popular now, and furthermore, it's lowercase. So the last point about authenticating the Special Operations Manual was Dale Bailey. This was a guy who was a, a yeoman for an admiral in the 76. He was 23 years old. He was ordered to destroy some classified documents. Some of the documents were t top secret, but he was just cleared for secret. Nevertheless, it was a weekend, and, and uh, my son and I interviewed him in 1999 uh, near La Crosse, Wisconsin. And he recalled what he saw for us. He said he saw the attachments in the Eisenhower briefing document. I haven't told you about that. That was the first one. But anyway, those attachments uh, had some marginalia in the, 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 uh, on the biological information. Nothing was blacked out. It was on onion skin paper. And the White House paper was embossed, as was the CIA paper. He saw the, the caveat, Navy eyes only, which again reinforces the idea that each one of the services had their own separate program. And his manual was cream and black print with letter size, but he did confirm that he saw this manual. And the last leaked document is the Bowen Manuscript. Now, this manuscript was written by a fellow who had a job in New York City downtown. And every noon hour, or every other noon hour, he would go to the library and look up everything about flying saucers and UFOs that he could find. And so he wrote a book in 1955 or 6, I think is when he finished it, of everything that had been published in the literature on that subject. And it was a 15 chapter book. And because he was a loyal citizen, and he had some comments here in one of his chapters about how the Air Force had screwed up regularly, uh, he decided that, that he would still show it to a friend of his to make sure that he wasn't violating security in talking about this. Well, he gave it to him in the late 50s. And in 1999, it was mailed back to my friend Tim Cooper from Fort Meade Intelligence. And it was stamped top secret. And here's the first page that shows the stamp top secret. Um, so I tried to find him. I called the and it turned out it was easy that the church that he used to go to knew his son and Pat. Pat and so Pat and I are in the process of getting this book printed as his father's book. And it's really kind of a good book, 350 pages, double spaced. It, it's going to be fun reading. And it won't have any ambiguities because it's just based on the information available up till the mid 50s. Here's a sample page. This one it happens to be a confidential page, has a confidential story. But uh, it includes not only some final corrections by Vernon Bowen here in this handwriting, but also notes by the various Air Force officers who read it and commented on it, in some cases commenting on the relationship to other classified material and to moon dust and, and other things. And so that's one of the reasons it's so significant. Now, many people ask what's happening recently. Basically, the documents that I have are those that were done during the era where you had to type things out, maybe with carbon paper. When the government computers went home, when they went electronic, uh, we don't have much leaking. There's, there's one example, one sam example, 
exception to that, and that is this one I got from Bill Hamilton, but I can't tell you anything about the authenticity. But uh, nevertheless, it's pretty interesting because it's clearly a reconstruction of a, uh, of a, of a document that was shredded. And it says, it's from Rancher. Now, Rancher is well known to be uh, George Bush's uh, name in, in this world. And it says, you're hereby directed to immediately remove Project Lotus and Starflower from Majestic 12 oversight and place the same under the authority of the committee. Well, these are the words that have been used to describe the secret program for years. It goes on to say, doctors Burrish and Severs will continue in their capacity until notice. That's significant to the UFO people who are familiar with the literature because uh, Dr. Burrish was one of the people who has come out of the closet allegedly and, and talked about how he was involved in interviewing uh, captured aliens at Area 51. Now, I compared, at one time I was a Republican and got a card or letter every year from George Bush. <laughs> and so I compared the initials I got on my Christmas card with the initials on this one. And all I can say is they're not quite the same, <laughs> but that doesn't prove anything. Okay, but you don't understand, I haven't even seen Europe yet. Now we're talking about really landed craft and the second part of my talk, which is about crash retrievals. And in crash retrievals is basically uh, represented by this book, Magic Eyes Only, which was done by my son Ryan. Now, Ryan and I have been partners in this business since the late 90s, and he probably would have been invited here today were it not for the fact that he just gave birth to two twins. Uh, on May 8th, I got a grand, grand, granddaughter, Avery Elizabeth Wood, and a grandson, Landon Robert Wood. So we're, we're ha happy for them. We haven't seen them yet. And they're still in the hospital, actually. So uh, doing well, though, five pounds plus. So he shipped them in case some of you wanted to buy them later. But I'm going to tell you about his book. And the fact that it's really an exciting book because it, it deals for the first time with a huge number of crashes, 74 crashes around the world that are, have really some degree of credibility. And he has an authenticity meter included that tells you how credible they are. And we'll talk about both of those. This is, you can see the cover of the book. Now, he signed up some pretty impressive enthusiasts to talk about the book. The, First one is John Hale uh, asking, do you think that uh, human science and culture are the highest possible in the universe? Do you think that those trillions of ancient stars that we just saw, Steve, show us, can grow no civilization with cleverness and desire to launch voyages of discovery? And do you think the governments tell all the truth all the time? <laughs> <laughs> Jim Mars says, many questions resolve, remain in the controversy, but for now, we couldn't do any better than to study magic eyes only and read the accounts of UFO crash retrievals. Stan Friedman, who is always ever present on the scene, says this is the first real attempt to make available to a widespread audience a large number of, of retrievals of government crash flying saucers. And he says even if only a small fraction of them are valid, then it's going to be profound implications for the history of mankind. And of course, that's disclosed. Rich Dolan says, looks like the technology does not appear to have originated from our civilization. And it's the best compendium and analysis of UFO crash retrievals to date. Linda Bolton Howe says, emphasizes the fact that it contains the, the things that occurred under FDR, as well as maybe this would bro, blow the uh, lid off the secrecy, like the steam and a pressure cooker, again, in endorsing exopolitics. And then this guy who's involved in the security business emphasizes that it's the tip of the cover-up iceberg, the scale and complexity, which is unprecedented in history, and I'll talk about that in the last part of my talk. So Magic Eyes Only overview uh, basically has 74 incidents, and they vary in quality and, and details and number of pages and sophistication, but each one has an authenticity meter, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. But the um, majestic document sources are discussed, about the uh, relationship to search for extraterrestrial intelligence and UFOs, UFOs and uh, how the national security has involved this. And statistically, it's, you know, it's a, long, it's a big book. It's got eight pages of color, 
with some stuff, other stuff that's been leaked that nobody's ever seen. It's footnoted, it's got a good appendix, got a good index. It answers the question of why do they crash, or at least this is my son's uh, view graph, Brian's view graph, as in his opinion as to why they crash, five reasons. Civilizations are not perfect, they can make mistakes, sometimes they're just d drones, they're not worth recovering. And most importantly, sometimes we've shot them down in order to get the data. And that, that's the thing that really impressed me is that uh, a major fraction of these, I think, are actually the result of our attempts to shoot them down. And, you know, I've, I've become acquainted with a fellow who uh, was actually about my son's age who worked in the Soviet Union. He was a, a fighter pilot and was actually in the KGB. And he tells me, that, and he was exposed to the UFO program. He tells me that in the Soviet Union, they had a very symmetrical situation. They were trying to shoot them down until they lost so many pilots that they stopped that process. So they had some shoot downs. They have some recovered crashes too, some of which are, are clearly authentic. And, and then concluding the other two points, that is a good lightning bolt is in the megawatts, you know, that can happen, it can be just an accidental. And then finally, early interfered. The criteria that Ryan uses are uh, shown here, the, the witnesses, whether they're firsthand or, or uh, the sources, uh, how many sources, are there zingers like this raised Z, uh, the content, uh, how, how solid is it, uh, the chronology, are there any anachronisms, uh, and the forensics, the old, in some cases we have original documents so we can do the physical trace testing and, and analyze the ink. So uh, here you can see the, uh, the little indicator for authenticity meter, and this is one for high. The, the pi is on the right, and it's a, clearly a case of, where it's authentic. Multiple witnesses, lots of physical evidence, forensic tests, substantial agreement with all the researchers. And these are basically taken to the bank. Uh, and the medium level would be example of cases that are under-researched. If you put more energy into it, you'll be able to determine whether or not they should go towards medium high or high. And statistically, there's five of them that are high authenticity. I think you probably know all of them. Aurora, 19, 1897 or eight, so I think. Um, Roswell cases, there's three of them there. Uh, Kecksburg, Shag Harbor, and Braxton County. Those are high authenticity. And then the others for medium authenticity are shown uh, Cape Girardeau, Missouri, uh, 1941 is the one that Ryan personally has researched. He's even researched it to the point that he thinks he knows the site location. But uh, uh, th there was a case where a minister was called out to bless the bodies. And he actually saw the bodies and there was a photograph that was taken of one of the bodies. Uh, see, the uh, Del Rio, Texas is an because that's a the same date as in the Eisenhower briefing document. And the Berwyn Mountains one is being discussed in more detail by Nick Redfern, who's made that as, as one of his specialties. Var Var Vargina, Brazil case, 1996 is the most recent. And, and I think that's very significant because the security officer who was asked to help move and handle the creature uh, actually uh, got a pathogen and he, he died with, with uh, similar, similar symptoms to those you have from mad cow disease. So th there is some concern about handling aliens uh, that you should be careful. This is the list of all the 74 different crash sites, which you look at them all at once, it's pretty impressive. And the statistics are shown here. Uh, he threw out three of them uh, due to meteorites He's going to add eight events, several more cases in his next edition. Um, and four of them have actually have parts with the wreckage. Well, Ryan is uh, very excited and enthusiastic about continuing his own independent research in the crash retrieval area. So he has held four conferences in Las Vegas, and the fifth one is coming up this November 9th to 11th. So he urged me if I'd give him a little plug for this conference. And I so uh, Rich Dolan is coming up with his new book, and uh, basically the, the focus is, is on crash, crash retrievals. Um, he's 
contemplating having Steve Bassett ask where we are in disclosure. Of course, Steve may have already told us a couple months earlier at his conference, but uh, he's contemplating asking me to talk about my new book on alien viruses. And Danny Sheehan is, might be the keynote bank banquet speaker. So anyway, it, it's a good conference. If, uh, if you have a chance to go, it's, uh, it's a good, you'll find it's one of the best ones. Lily, let's see if there's anything on the 6 o'clock news about it. <laughs> and this is just what Steve was talking about. You know, we don't, we don't see it on the news. We have just been exposed to the most sophisticated disinformation program since, the, uh, since that of the Nazis and the Soviets. And I think ours has been more effective. So what I'm going to do is to tell my simplistic opinion about the 12 different techniques that are used to keep us all in the dark. Uh, well, to keep, to keep us all in the dark, not all of us, because some of us know the answer, but to keep generally the public in the dark so that the widespread understanding is, is not what we know in this room. Twelve things. First is straightforward. You suppress the pilot reports. You don't let the media get at the pilots because these are direct witnesses. They do that with the military. straightforward, but uh, they've been able to accomplish that also with the commercial pilots, just because it turns out that if commercial pilots get involved in reporting to the media, they wind up going nowhere and lose their jobs. The second is denigrating witness testimony. This started at the very beginning. You always ask, well, how many beers did you have when, you, when this happened to you? You play up the skeptical views. You always have somebody from the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of the Claims of the Paranormal, or PSYCOP. Uh, now they've shortened it to PSI to capture the linkage with the, the uh, forensic programs that are going on uh, murders. False press releases are straightforward. That is, the military agencies have, you know, all, people have said that military intelligence is an oxymoron. But actually, that's not true. Military intelligence is some of the finest intelligence that we've ever had. General Doolittle was in charge of the psychological operations before. And we've got better and better and better on on the process. Well, one of the straightforward things you do is you just put out a press release that's totally false. And they do that all the time. So you should never assume that a press release has anything to do with the truth. They use slanted words. This culture has seeped very effectively into the media. They use the words myth, belief, cult, or claim. And interestingly enough, you know, the National Enquirer was at one time owned by the CIA. And so most people probably didn't know that. But if if the CIA wanted to plant a story on uh, UFOs, what they would do is they would release a legitimate one, a legitimate story to the National Enquirer, get that out, and nobody would believe it. So it was out, out there, and they established the lack of credibility of UFO stories that way. 20 years ago, you could go to the library or you could go to a bookstore and say, where are your UFO, UFO books? You can't do that. You have to go to the New Age section where you have it along with the tarot cards and the witches and everything else. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that, but the fact of the matter is a lot of people would like to go to the UFO section in a library or in a bookstore. There's daily control over the broadcast and print media. Now, I can't prove this because I think it's a secret meeting, but in my opinion, there is a meeting early in the morning back east somewhere where they describe and discuss the non-subjects of is the non-subject going to be that, that vaccinations have some bad things in them? Or is it going to be that maybe 9-11 was an inside job? Or is it going to be that, hey, there's some really credible things about UFOs? So these are controlled. And then a psychological evaluation, there are, there are techniques that have been done. You take, um, um, say, officers in training, put them into a movie and show them a legitimate, authentic recovery, crash recovery of UFO. And then monitor their phone calls, see what they call. You get a feeling for how widespread the panic might be. Penetration of archives by counterintelligence is straightforward. And systematically re destroying the records is, is obviously what, what you do. The fact that you can't find anything in the National Archives through the Freedom of Information Act uh, on the critical subject should be no surprise at all, because you'd expect the people there to be doing exactly what we're trying to do, namely to find documents that prove that we've had this program. And those 
have all been scrubbed, taken out of the archives, or at least put in the section that's still secret. And then occasionally they would leak fakes to confuse people like myself, so <laughs> who are trying to uh, get documents that, and research the documents that show that there has been a program of, of great sophistication trying to understand how the technology works. I assure you, madam, if any such creatures as you describe really existed, we would be the first to know about it. Now, I like this cartoon because not only does it convey the essence of sophistication in uh, psychological warfare, but it even includes the aliens in the process. And so I think that's the kind of vision and perspective you need to have as you deal about what is the truth. So I'm going to summarize, and I, I think I may be a little early, actually. Is that right? Well, I don't know. But anyway, I'm going to finish up here uh, summarizing that several alien species have been involved for years. Now, that's not to say that the, uh, it weren't, wasn't also millennia, because everything that Angelica said you know, to the people was perfectly valid, and, and everything that Hector said this morning was valid with respect to ancient civilizations. I'm really talking about just the more modern times. But you know, there's a half a dozen different species involved. We've effectively kept the crash recoveries secret using deception, and the secrets can be and are well kept. Uh, there's always assumption that there'll be some leaks that come occur, and, the, and those leaks will be managed, and they've been managed. Now, I used to think that bad was really straightforward, and that the good guys were those who uh, wanted to see the truth come out, and the bad guys were those who wanted to, to keep it hidden. But Actually, I've softened my criteria a little bit, and I think, you know, if you go back and understand the history and the circumstances of the time, there may be some reasonable argument for FDR wanting to keep the recovery of two crashed saucers secret from the Nazis in 1952. And so once you begin the secrecy process, it gets very hard to get out of. But Steve is working on it, as are most of the other speakers in this group. Who, who are following the theme that Michael used. And I had this slide in here before Michael uh, quoted it the other day. <laughs> that Margaret Mead said, that never doubt that a, a small group of committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that has, and that people is right here. So, so I see I, I got a sign that says 10 minutes. I uh, can take any questions if there are any. And, and we'll have to get up and ask questions here, even though you, we don't have a mic for them, just speak loudly. Okay. Um, I, Bob, I really appreciate your presentation, and this is the kind of material and the scientific investigation that I think this field really needs, so I can't praise you enough for the work you've done. Uh, what I thought I'd contribute to the contract is that when Ryan came to the Washington, D.C. area, can anyone hear me? Yeah. Um, yes. When Ryan came to the Washington, D.C. area, I had the privilege and opportunity to go to the National Archives with him, mm -hmm. the uh, one right in my neighborhood. And, uh, and it was a great experience for me because we were looking for the um, uh, day after Roswell, yeah. uh, Cor uh, Ors Corson? Um, Corson. Uh, Corso, uh, Lieutenant Corso's correspondence to his superior officer. And what you said about the records being destroyed, it was perplexing to find all the records of that time showing Cor Corso's activities, including night vision. I found, I was the one that actually found one of the original documents, the original document of night vision. So I was really pleased we were on the track of all this stuff, but not a single record of his correspondence on a piece of paper with a Supreme officer. And uh, so you're absolutely right. They got to the archives before we did. Thank you for that comment. In some cases, however, you can get the documents that they missed. And so the purpose of going to the archives is to look at the documents they missed, and then sometimes you get a real good one. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay. If you, if you, had a, you made a clock and had an exposure clock on there. Where would the minute hand be? Oh, okay. Well, that's the question is, where would I think the minute hand would be on the exposure clock for 
well, I'll assume the clock you're talking about is disclosure, the disclosure clock, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think it would be, uh, I think you want the answer actually in, in days, months, or years. <laughs> I think in a couple of years, a couple of years, I think the work of, of, of Steve and other people like him will maybe squeak it out. But the, the, the process that's in place by the powers that want to control it and keep it out is, is very impressive. And it's a hard, it's a hard process to, to, to get around. Yes, Joel. Bob, the, the UFO ET research community seems to have uh, split opinions on the, uh, the intentions of visitors, whether there's, they're all benign or mostly benign, some with mostly just self-interest. I'm curious what your own opinion is. On no, that. My, my opinion is that there is one group, the, the Greys, I believe, that really would like to get our genetic material, and that's not good. That's not helpful, not friendly. <laughs> but I think the, the majority of the others are, are benign. Some of them, I think, are actively concerned with our, our future. I think there are some instances in the past where there have been clearly interference with important events. I mean, oh, the, there was one case where an ICBM was launched towards Kwajalein, and that was interfered with by a UFO. And so there's other cases where we've had the, the, per, the, the it was launched from the Pacific Missile Range to Kwajalein Atoll as an experimental vehicle, but it, it didn't have a nuclear weapon in it, presumably. But nevertheless, it's a good example of how UFOs can actually interfere with a vehicle while, while it's en route. And then, of course, there are a number of cases where we've had uh, failures in our underground missile silos. And I think it's quite possible that those may have been intentionally accomplished because the ETs knew that there was a process in place that there would be an inadvertent missile launch if they didn't interfere. So that's a little speculation, but it's, it's clear that there are some, some of them are clearly actively helping us. Some of them are actively thoughtless <laughs> about us. And I think the majority of them, say three or four, are kind of just here monitoring, hoping things go well. And, but I think all of them have, I, I would say most of them, uh, would have uh, an agreement with the goals of keeping our planet Earth a healthy place. And I think that, that you would get support from, say, three of the five races in, in that. Other questions? Here comes the questioner. <laughs> well, I know you come from an aerospace background, and my, my father was Lockheed. Yeah. He's down yeah. at uh, yeah. Ontario. Uh -huh. And I remember when I was about seven, about 1956, seeing something that looked like a cruise missile. And uh, nobody believed that I saw it, but it was moving at a slow enough speed that I could, you know, see details on it. But uh, I wondered if you know anything about, was that like, American-made technology. I mean, I don't think the cruise missiles were around then, publicly. Okay. I, I, the, que the question is, what would be my comments on whether or not we've been successful in making them? Is that, can I broaden the question yeah, for you? Know, yeah. What was going yeah. on during that yeah. period? Yeah. The, the answer is I don't have any knowledge about what was going on in that period. But my uh, uh, op initial opinion is I as I became active and knowledgeable about this was that we had not been successful in reverse engineering this technology at Area 51. My present opinion is not quite the opposite, but I would say I've got reasonable confidence that we've been working on that problem very hard and that we've made a lot of strides. So I think our classified programs have a great deal of insight as to how they might work and some of them may have already been, been, been built effectively. I even conjecture from time to time, again, I, I would clarify the difference between being confident and conjecturing. <laughs> I would conjecture that it's possible that our capability is so sophisticated that it was a factor in ending the Cold War when the Soviets might have figured, well, they could never beat all this high technology. But I don't know that. Thank you for that question. I can agree with you. Yeah. Thank you.
many of the people that I, I talk to and hear from have a feeling that there's some kind of forward advanced contact going on globally with the planet. And the feeling is something like global first contact from a, an intelligence or a race that's advanced and prolific coming to, but maybe hasn't arrived at the Earth yet. Do you think the weaponization of space is this shadow government's effort to protect the Earth from the arrival of that force? Do I think that, and everybody heard that question, I guess. Um, the answer is that I have not been involved in following the weaponization of space closely, but I do feel that it's important. I, I feel that it's very important for us to embrace some of the spirituality ideas that people have mentioned during this conference, because I think that the uh, linkage of ourselves with the ETs in useful ways will be enhanced specifically by linking our minds with the, the process that somehow permits us to communicate and interact psychically. So even though I'm sort of an, an ordinary engineer with a degree in physics, I happen to believe that there's a lot of things that we don't understand. And one of them is how they communicate with each other and how they can sit in the ship and maybe drive it just with their mind. I think it's a possibility. And getting back to this weaponization of space, <clears throat> of the craft in the skies today, in Mexico, Belgium, all these different things that have been happening in the last five or six years, what percentage of those would you say were extraterrestrial in origin versus man-made? Uh, is there a, do you see a, like a clear distinction okay. of man-made craft yeah. versus something that might be from another world? Okay, uh, everybody heard the question. The question was limited to the last five or six years. And in the last five or six years, I'd say, that, well, if it's a flying triangle, you know, it could have been ours. But if you go back to the data 20, 30 years ago and take those reports, in fact, I just did a little um, conference with that with some of the MUFON board of directors. We took some, some cases that were back in the 40s and 50s, and the, the evidence was so overwhelming that these are, could not have been something that we could have made back then. Sure. That, that the, the, the answer, the answer today is different from what it would be then. In, in my opinion, uh, some of the craft that are seen in the sky are indeed ours, but most of the craft are theirs, especially those that are involved in right angle turns. Okay, it looks like it's... One, one more question. One more question. Since you have a lot of knowledge about physics and engineering. About what? Physics and engineering. Oh, yes. Okay. The application. Of yes, right. Uh, I thought a lot about thinking out uh, about technology and, and where it goes and what's possible down the line. This is a tough question. I mean, not only for, for us as uh, humans, but also for political politicians. What advanced alien beings would be able to do with the tech that they have? Uh, advanced, let's talk 10,000 years mm -hmm. or more, a million, whatever, 10,000, but 10,000 more than enough. Is it realistic at all that we could possibly prevail <coughs> in a violent uh, interaction with, with species at that level. Uh, okay, everybody heard the question? I think one way to answer the question is to think back to 10,000 or 100,000 years and look at the societies that Angelica was talking about the other day. Those societies were pretty sophisticated and uh, they seem to have captured some of the technology that we are still trying to find. I believe that our Star Wars program was specifically designed to uh, shoot down some of the craft. I think we've been exceptionally successful and probably lucky, if you want the word, in, in, in getting maybe 10 or 20 different craft from different societies. You know, a lot of them that come don't come because they've, uh, let me back up. A lot of the visitors are coming here for the first time because there's so many different societies, you should not expect to, to see just a few. You should expect to see many. And if a visitor is coming for the first time and has not much knowledge about our society, not be ready to, to get a, a homing missile, you know? And so 
that's what happened, I'm sure, in some cases. But I think that. Um, Let's hope Hawaii never treats first time visitors. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I think the, the, the sophisticated ETs that are 10,000 years ahead of us, for the most part, they're not going to be troubled by our, by our weapons. But I think if they're, if they're, they can have accidents, as my son said, you know, it could hit by lightning, you know. But uh, I think our weapons generally will not be able to shoot them down. And my time is over. I got a sign. <laughs>